Hello Internet, my name is Ren. This is Ren Rants, a channel where I rant about many things that I care about with a particular focus on pop culture and politics. In this video, we'll be taking a look, finally, at The Orville Season 2, Episode 4, Nothing Left on Earth Excepting Fishes. And I have to say, I am so excited to finally be getting caught up on The Orville. I know I am way behind. Thank you for everyone who has been so patient with me. I am so sorry. Hopefully I don't get this behind again because it is a stressful way to live. All I have to do now is a review of the premiere for Discovery and then all of my time sensitive videos will finally be caught up. I'm so excited. I do have some other stuff coming down the pipeline that I recorded ages ago and didn't get around to editing, so hopefully you will be seeing that soon as well. But again, thank you so much for your patience. I will be uploading these reviews just rapid fire just to get them out to you guys, so I'll try to get them out as quickly as I can. We'll be doing a new format with this video where I talk for a few minutes more generally about the episode and my impression of it, and this will be spoiler free, which means that if you haven't seen the episode, you can watch this part of the video without worrying, and then I will give you an on-screen spoiler warning before I start getting into the particulars of the episode, so you can clear out and go watch the episode and then come back. Or, for a more pleasurable viewing experience, just go watch the episode first. But at least at this point you've been warned, so now you can't yell at me for spoilers. Alright, so my overall spoiler-free impression of this episode is that I think this is actually my favorite episode so far in Season 2. I've really been liking the direction they were going so far, but I think this one really hits a different level in terms of sophistication with the emotional storytelling in this episode. I think the plot is pretty generic. Both the A plot and the B plot are definitely recycled from not only older Star Trek, but other sci-fi shows as well. So the plot itself is kind of meh, but the actual storytelling that they do with the plot is amazing. And I think that what their strength really is, is taking those more generalized sci-fi concepts and tropes and then trying to sort of bring new life to them. So in this episode we get a lot more emotional depth for Captain Mercer's character, and I think that was really necessary because we've only seen a couple of sort of dimensions of him. We've seen him as the bitter ex-husband who's been cheated on and trying to rebuild that relationship into some kind of either relationship or friendship, and we have seen him as the captain with his first command who's sort of unsure of what he's doing but is doing his best. And in this episode I think we get to see a different side of his character really flourish and I think that that ends up really adding a lot of depth and sincerity to his character overall and I think it was very much needed and the way that they did it I think was really successful. They made a lot of really good writing decisions in this episode and the way that they told the story I think was really, really effective. There's sort of a big reveal in this episode, and it's honestly pretty predictable. I figured it out pretty early on in the episode, and also from some whisperings I had heard elsewhere, which I will get into more in my spoiler content. But I think honestly, even with how not entirely surprising that reveal was, it was still really impactful to the story, and it still resulted in meaningful emotional consequences that, again, I think really furthered where I think this show is going. Because at first it had some shaky moments in season one, and it struggled here and there in season two a little bit still to find its footing, which is fine. I know that it can sometimes take shows quite a while to figure out what they're doing, and so I'm not, I'm not mad or anything, but I... I think that this hits kind of a new level in terms of the way I see the characters and especially the way that we see Ed. Because the previous episodes, or this season, haven't really been that Ed-focused. The first episode was sort of a meet and greet for all the characters, where we spent a little bit of time with Ed, but it was mostly a side of him that we've already seen. 
and the second episode, of course, was more focused on Bordas and Clyden. The third episode was more focused on Alara. And so in this episode, we finally get to focus a little bit more on Ed, and I think it was really, really effective. So that is my spoiler-free review of this episode. If you want to know more, either keep watching at your own risk or go watch the episode because spoilers from here on out, you have been warned. So this plot, of course, is an A plot and a B plot because that is how this series likes to sort of structure its episodes, and I think that's fine. I think that's a good way to structure a show when you have more of an ensemble cast like you do with the Orville, and I think it works really, really well. So the A plot is definitely what we spend the most time on the, in this episode, and the B plot is kind of entirely contained within the A plot. So the A plot, just for a general recap, is a relationship transpiring between Ed and Lieutenant Janelle Tyler. And the, that they are getting along very well. We get a little scene of them cuddling on the couch watching the king and die, and Ed drapes his jacket adoringly around her, and it's just a very cute moment, and we get to see what Ed is like when he's in love. Because we've really only seen Ed in more of the aftermath of what happened with he and Kelly's relationship, and when they got back together, sort of, or when that door was more open, it still had all that baggage with it from, from the beginning of the season. But with Janelle, there is no baggage, so we get to see what Ed is like as a clean slate when he's in love, and it's adorable. It's so cute. And I think seeing that more tender, vulnerable side of him without any of the bitterness really helps kind of drive home more of who he is when he's not going through something. And I think we really needed that to continue empathizing with his character and enjoying his character. So I think that was a great choice. Ed and Janelle decide that they are going to take their relationship public, so Ed tells Gordon first, and then he tells Kelly, and both of them are very supportive. He tried to respect that he knows that Gordon had feelings for Janelle as well, and so he's very gentle about telling him, and I think Gordon really appreciates that, and so it's just a nice moment between those two. And it does really feel like Malloy genuinely is very happy for him. And then he tells Kelly, and that conversation also goes really well. And I, again, really think that was a good choice because the conversation between him and Kelly really does seem like Kelly is happy for him, and he's finally recovering enough to let go of her a little bit more as well. And it's kind of just this comfortable moment of acceptance between the two of them. There's not really any undercurrents of jealousy. And we also kind of see that Kelly really does know Ed very well, because she knew that he was seeing Janelle from his smile. He apparently has 15 of them, 3 are happy, 11 are passive-aggressive, which I do believe, and 1 is for when he's in love, and she's been seeing that love smile around whenever Janelle walks onto the bridge. And that is precious. Just precious. So I love this intro. It just gets me feeling all warm and fuzzy about the characters, and that's that's excellent. Everything takes a turn though when Ed and Janelle decide to go on a trip. Ed has stockpiled a lot of shore leave because he doesn't ever take vacations really and so Janelle convinces him to go on a vacation with him I think to a planet called Sensoria 2 or something. Whatever, I'm not looking it up. It's not important, you leave me alone nerds. A Krill convoy appears on the map, so they turn on their cloaking device and hope that they don't see them. And at first they think they've gotten away with it, the three ships pass, and they think they're good, but then the ships turn around and start venting drive plasma, and it creates almost an ink screen where it reveals the hidden ship, and so they drag the ship aboard with Ed and Janelle inside. And here's where we kind of cut to the B-plot. It might have been a little bit earlier, but I'm going to summarize the entire B-plot right here because there isn't really all that much to it. Everything that transpires on the Orville basically before they go to rescue Ed and Janelle is 
a meeting between Bordas and Kelly where they discuss that they've hired a new security officer to replace Alara and they are both relieved that Tharl will no longer be in the position because both of them have noticed that he's very irritating and has a number of unpleasant quirks like wearing sandals everywhere. The other more important component of the B-plot is that Gordon wants to take the command test and it's basically like a miniaturized version of the episode I Own Self in TNG where Deanna Troy wants to take the command test and Riker has all the answers but he can't tell her and she has to riddle it out for her herself and this is kind of similar where it's a challenge and initially it doesn't seem like Kelly thinks that Gordon has what it takes but she agrees to help administer the test anyway but warns him that it could take months and he has some setbacks and failings while he's trying to progress and Kelly questions if he's doing it for the right reasons or if he just wants to get the status to pick up ladies but then Gordon reveals that he's been feeling kind of stagnant and bored with flying and he wants to do something else and it's kind of a nice encouraging moment between the two of them and I think we'll see that expanded on later on because we don't get a resolution of him completely passing or failing the test before the episode ends. So it's kind of a nice way that we kind of again see another side of a character which is Gordon being a little bit more ambitious than we may have been led to believe before. So this episode is very much about characters showing us more, wanting more, showing us another side of themselves and this episode just does so many things so well. Back aboard the Krill vessel, Ed is being held prisoner and they are torturing Janelle if he doesn't give them his command codes. Eventually he cracks and gives them the command codes and he thinks that hopefully uh, he's saved Janelle's life at the very least, but then it's revealed that Janelle never existed and I was not surprised by this development at all because JP at Egotastic Fun Time has predicted everything and he predicted this repeatedly and very specifically and he was right because Janelle Tyler is actually Talea in disguise. You'll remember from season one in the episode Krill, she was the teacher aboard the Krill vessel where Gordon and Ed decided to save the children and Talea was in the classroom with them, but did kill everyone else on board, including Talea's brother. So... Good job, dude! Damn! I kind of thought that was a little bit of a kooky sort of prediction, but then it, it seemed more and more plausible. And I knew for sure that JP was right when Janelle said, let's take a trip. As soon as she said that, I was like, oh, so that you can kidnap him. So good job, JP. Damn. I am so impressed. He predicted two major events for this season so far and was very, very right. He may have predicted more. I have not kept up with him, but the episodes of his show that I've watched had me prepared, son. I was prepared. So I wasn't all that shocked by the reveal, but I still really liked what they did with it because I did not predict what happened next, which is some goblin looking binches come and attack the Krill ship. Ed and Talia escape together in a pod that's automatically programmed to take them to the nearest habitable planet. It even seeks out the night side of the planet because if you'll remember, Krill are very sensitive to light. And they land on the planet successfully and I kind of wonder about the wisdom of this policy because on one hand I understand trying to get them to the nearest habitable planet as soon as possible, but what if like in this exact situation the nearest habitable planet is where the people attacking you live and you are just landing in the thick of their territory with no idea where you are or where you're going or what you're supposed to do. So they land on the planet, they're immediately discovered by some of the goblin benches. They run away and take refuge in a cave because the sun is coming up soon and Talea can't go out in the sun again because Krill are very sensitive to light. And throughout this process there's a lot of conversation between Ed and Talea about how much of that relationship was faked. Ed keeps pointing out all of the specifically nice things that she did like making him a grilled cheese sandwich and at one point it's really clear that she's also absorbed all of his quirks because when he's going to go to sleep she tells him to sleep on his back not his side because he snores which 
is a very intimate thing to remember about someone. So while she staunchly denies that there was nothing real between them and that it was all artifice to get revenge, it's pretty obvious that there was at least a little something more. And that makes sense because they did kind of connect in Krill as well. In that first episode we saw with them in season one, they definitely had kind of a rapport and she was sort of welcoming when she didn't realize that they were infiltrating her ship. And I like that it was sort of a tit for tat kind of thing where she was deliberately trying to get revenge. In fact, she actually told him that she specifically was the one who chose him after she volunteered for the mission to kidnap a Union captain. So I found that really, really interesting. And I thought that they did a great job of building up that relationship between the two of them with just enough vulnerability and reluctance. And I do like that she still kind of stuck to her guns and even if she did have more feelings for him than she let on, a lot of the time she really was not willing to make any any compromises. So Ed realizes that a day on this planet lasts 23 days, which means that there's no way they have enough food to last until nightfall comes around again, so Ed has to place the beacon alone. Ed places the distress beacon, he's chased back to the cave by goblins, and once again drapes his coat over her adorably in order to protect her from the sun, Gordon and Bordis are sent by the Orville on a shuttle-based rescue mission and they land with the shuttle door on the ground in mid-air. So they actually are in mid-air with the shuttle door as the only thing that's really touching the ground and Ed and Talia dash madly aboard the shuttle. Back aboard the Orville, Ed decides to make the choice to let Talia go. So she contacts her people and they come to pick her up and there's this really sweet goodbye where she tells him that releasing her back to her people isn't going to change relations between them at all and Ed just tells her that it's a defect of his species, that we never give up hope. And I really love that message. He then gives her a copy of The Best of Billy Joel on some kind of little future disc and tells her if she ever wants to do movie night again that she knows where to find him. And then he watches her go in this adorable, tender little scene, and it's so clear that he still loves her even with everything that happened between them. And I just love that this episode really isolates the best in Ed and the best in humanity. And I just love the way that they did it. I think it really warms you to Ed's character in a whole new way, especially with some of the weird stuff that they've done with him before. And so I'm really, really happy with how this episode all came together. There were some really nice conversations between them about trust and where she reminded him that he betrayed her first by infiltrating her ship and killing her brother. And so where she's coming from is a pretty reasonable place. I'd want, want revenge too under those circumstances. So you get to know both of their characters better and develop more empathy for them. And the episode does end on kind of this hopeful note because he sends her back with a message that they can either keep fighting each other or they can talk. And all of it's tied in really nicely with a line from a song in The King and I where he sings about how unless somebody trusts somebody, there'll be nothing left on earth excepting fishes. And just continuing to isolate and appreciate that theme throughout the episode, I think, was a really good choice. And it does feel reminiscent of kind of 90s Trek where there would often be little bits that would feature pop culture from kind of that era of Earth history particularly musicals and literature and things like that, and so it was nice seeing that again. I am just so happy with the Orville so far, especially this season and especially this episode. I am so excited for this week's episode and I am so excited to see what the rest of this season has in store. Did you have any favorite moments from this episode? Let me know in the comment section down below. And if you have any predictions for the rest of this season, I would love to see those as well. But that's all I have for you. I am finally caught up. If you like my videos, subscribe for more Orville content and other pop culture and more political content as well. See you next time. Peter Zane.